Hey golfers, and welcome back to another episode of the Second Swing Thoughts podcast. Today we have a couple special guests. Um, we have a couple members of the University of Minnesota men's golf team. Ben Warian and Jacob Peterson are with us today. Um, first of all, guys, thanks for joining us. I know you guys just kind of completed your fall season, uh, but so let's kind of let you guys introduce yourselves a little bit, your background, um, you know, anything that you know, maybe the listener or viewer her might not be closely following the Gophers, you know, maybe something that you guys want to share with them. So Ben, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having us as well. Um, yeah, I uh, grew up around here just down the road, um, down in Stillwater, Minnesota. Um, so local local boy, um, yeah, kind of grew up bleeding, bleeding maroon and gold, and yeah, always been uh, kind of very mm -hmm. passionate about um, kind of the golf, especially around here, um, and, and kind of promoting that to the the best of my ability. Um, so yeah, it's kind of always a, a, a lifelong dream of mine to play for the Gophers. And um, yeah, it's pretty pretty cool to be kind of living out that dream. Yeah. Jacob? Yeah, so Jacob Peterson, I'm from Minnetonka. Um, I'm actually a transfer in. So I started playing division three golf for three years and some change at Gustavus Adolphus down in St. Peter. Um, never really thought I'd end up at the Gophers, honestly, but just kind of fell into my lap one day. So this is my second year with them, second and last one, so. Very nice, very nice, yeah. As a, and I know a little bit about the D3 mm -hmm. golf landscape. It's actually pretty competitive in in the Mayak Conference, I, yeah, I it's will fun. say, yeah. It's a good time. Uh, all right, so to get, get us warmed up here, I have a few you know quick rapid fire questions. I'll just, I'll read them off. You guys can just give your answer one, one each. Um, I got four of them here. So uh, first one, would you rather make an ace or an albatross? I'd have to go albatross. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I'd have to go albatross. That would be pretty sick. Have That's, you made one of either one of them? I've made one ace. Okay. One of them. Jacob? I have, I have one of each. You I'd do. go albatross. Albatross. You, okay. <laughs> I, I have not made an albatross, and that, that seems like that's like the next like golden, golden yeah. goose for me is making an albatross. But um, I've always, because I, I feel like it's 50 50 among golfers, like if it's like the ace yeah. or the albatross better. But interesting. Um, all right. Now we'll start with Jacob this time. Your dream, you know, the three players that would make up your dream foursome. Oh Lord. Um, goodness gracious. I'm gonna go with, can it be anyone? Hey, yeah, literally anybody. Past um, or present. Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan. And then I, I don't, this is gonna be wild, but I've seen videos of Yao yeah. Ming playing golf. Wow, <laughs> <So> <laughs> that is not what I had on my, <laughs> And my bingo card. I just today. gotta check it out. Okay, okay, I like it. <laughs> Yao Ming. Um, you gonna top that one, Ben? Or what? Gosh, I don't know if I can top that one. Um, I'd have to go. Um, I'd have to go Tiger as well. Yeah. Um, I'd have to go with um, with my dad. Um, always, always a treat getting to play with him. Um, growing up and kind of. He mm -hmm. was kind of the guy who made me fall fall in love with yeah. golf, honestly. So always a treat playing with him. Um, oh, and then for my third guy, um, I don't know, why don't, why don't we toss DJ Collard in there? Let's go golf. Oh, okay. Hey, let's, <laughs> let's go, go golf. Go go I love it. Let's go golf. I love it. That's quite the eclectic group. That is quite, that the, would be quite the group. That would that's be quite, awesome. the, quite the combination of personalities. Um, that's yeah. great. Yeah, maybe a, maybe a little scramble. <laughs> team, team one versus team two scramble. Yeah. You guys I'd groups. like our chances. Yeah. yeah, well, I guess you got Tiger and both. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you'd have to, yeah, you'd have to <laughs> that's play in okay. both. Uh, ben, start this time. So the menu that you would uh, serve if you won at Augusta, or oh boy. I guess the PGA, you know, Champions Dinner menu. Boy, that's that's a good question. Um, oh man, I'd have to go. I'd probably go with um, probably go with fajitas, chicken and steak fajitas for the main course. Okay. I've always been a big a big uh, fan of Mexican food, so yeah. I'd have to have to throw that in there. Um, and then for a dessert, um, we'll go with, we'll just go with just the stock, just chocolate chip cookies, yeah. ice cream, just, yeah, just, we'll, we'll keep it, keep it really simple, that's a, that's really standard. That's a safe standard. one, right? Really yeah, standard. It's never going to disappoint. Yeah, 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 exactly. All right. I think I'd just go like, like a proper, like barbecue. Yeah. Oh yeah. You're going like full like authentic Southern Texas barbecue. barbecue. Yeah. 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 Something like that. You can't beat that. Though. No. That's pretty good. Okay. All right. Last one here. Um, the... A tour pro that you emulate your game after. If there's one, I guess, again, you, I know we always, you probably 
have the mindset like this is my game, this is my swing, you know. But would you say that there's one player that you might emulate more or, or try to, um, I guess, replicate? Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> for me, I mean, I, this isn't really intentional, but probably uh, probably Phil a little bit. Okay. Um, I have a tendency to hit it uh, pretty crooked and nice. uh, kind of find it and, you know, just put a score together somehow, I guess. So probably Phil, even though I don't really, uh, I guess, that's not really intentional. I'd love to be more of a kind of a, just a really solid ball striker. You just hit a ton of greens and, you yeah. know, you know, just keeps things really, really simple and stress-free. That's, sure. that's uh, unfortunately not really been the case for me in my golf career thus far, but um, yeah, probably, I can, probably a I little bit. I can relate to that one, yeah. I think. You know, my rounds tend to be a little adventurous. Sometimes, exactly. So. You know, get your money's worth out yeah, of it. Yeah, right? exactly. Explore, make sure you explore the whole golf course. Right, right. You got one, Jacob? Yeah, I was kind of leaning towards Phil. Yeah. Just somewhat like, I don't know, I'd like, like, if I'm in the fairways, it's usually pretty solid, but getting off the tee is the big challenge. So, like, okay. Phil or, like, Wesley Bryan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just kind of slap you off the tee. <laughs> and then figure it out. I love it. I love it. Well, um, nice. We're kind of warmed up now. I, I love that because clearly you guys have, like, you know, it, it's, you're very talented, very, um, like, core golfers, right? We kind of just have this thing at Second Swing where we like to think of the core avid golfer out there as someone who plays a ton of golf and obviously has D1 golfers. You guys are doing that. But at the same time, you're very unique in even your dream foursome or your your meal if you would you know win uh, at Augusta. Um, but with that said, too, I wanted to ask about like the the day in the life of like a, a, a D1 golfer. Is it like you guys have probably different classes. You guys have, you know, when you're in season at you know, do you guys practice at the same time? Do you guys, like, how does that all work for, for the team? And do you guys have, you know, you work your schedules for golf? Does it change in the off season? How does that all work for you guys? Say, like, you're looking at probably two people who have very different schedules. Really? Yeah. Yeah, no one will work harder than this guy. <laughs> um, so, I mean, in season, it's like a lot of practicing together, yeah. playing together yeah. and qualifying and stuff. Like, it's just kind of always hustling, but... Yeah. Off season, like right now, um, it's pretty mellow. And then we'll kind of start ramping up here in like a week. It'll be still pretty relaxed. Like they don't, the mandatory hours are very low in the off season okay. weeks. So we're not practicing like collectively as a team a bunch, but um, just kind of doing yeah. stuff to like keep the rust off. And then in the winter. Yeah, what kind of stuff out. do you do then in the, in the winter? I mean, you, I imagine you don't put on the clubs for months at a time without touching them right so like what what type of thing do you guys do obviously we're in minnesota where there's not golf courses open for a lot of the year so yeah the winter time i'd say is a really good time to like work on anything technically that you want to get better at so if you want to make a swing change um for sure change anything equipment wise mm -hmm. um kind of get that all ironed out um the, the winter time is a great time to do that additionally i think uh Ball striking is something we can still uh, get a lot better at. Just you know, hitting it, hitting it straighter, hitting it, hitting it farther um, with some of the work we've been doing in the gym as well. Um, yeah, basically outside of of 50 yards with the technology that we have, like like you know, you have a second swing with the track man and and those those types of, of things um, really are great tools to use to really stay sharp and continue to get better in those mm -hmm. aspects um, throughout the winter. And we're lucky enough to have very similar things at, at the U. Um, so yeah, definitely take advantage of those to keep keep moving forward in that aspect. Was that the launch monitor stuff? Is that, did you guys have access to that prior? Like trying to think, cause I know in the last maybe five to 10 years maybe is when you've seen this really big shift into golfers, you know, maybe even junior golfers that are trying to make it to the next level they dive into the numbers and they, you know, they get with the coach and they see, you know, they pay attention to long, launch angle, spin, et cetera. Um, are you guys diving into that stuff in particular, like all the time, or is that a lot more of, you know, tinkering with a swing or tinkering with things like that um, versus diving into the technical data points? I think it kind of just depends on the player. Okay. I'm like, I would say I'm more like a field type player golf yeah. swing wise. So I'm really only looking at carry numbers and spin rates a little bit, but like you'll definitely have guys who dive into path and everything like that. It totally just depends yeah. on the kind of brain you have. For sure, yeah. Like I'm pretty minimalist in that aspect as well. Like I really, yeah, mm -hmm. like he said, only really care about how far the ball is going, what it's spinning at, you know, if I'm 
trying to feel low shot, like obviously is it launching lower, high shot is it launching higher, stuff like that. Um, I like to be pretty minimalist with that as well. And you guys, how, here's another one, because uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're equipment club people at Second Swing. So for the, do you guys upgrade clubs frequently? Do you guys like to play the same club or clubs for a long time if they're working? I mean, where do you guys stand on that? On that uh, issue yeah I mean I certainly like to get everything checked at least on a yearly basis you know it could be you know I, I take uh, take everything in to get checked and maybe you know I don't know irons I, I found a, a set of irons that's working a little bit better dispersions a little bit tighter what, whatever it may be and you know I may make the switch there um, or you know driver three wood could be you know that my old stuff actually could be performing better than some of the new stuff whether it's you know yeah. I still might be hitting it farther or I still could be hitting it a lot straighter which is which is huge for me as well so really it depends um, if I do actually end up making the switch on a yearly basis but um, yeah I certainly like to be be consistent with checking on a yearly basis checking everything out yeah it seems like that's one issue that you know obviously the we you know, we never expect the average golfer to be checking up on their equipment like every six months or whatever. But you know, at someone at your guys' level, it's you know, and you're trying to make birdies upon birdies in your round, like checking that stuff, making sure that's dialed. In addition to making sure that your swing is dialed, is probably very important for you guys. You know, if you see something is off or maybe your lie angle has changed and you didn't realize it, like suddenly that can make a big impact on your on your game. Yeah, honestly, it really can. Um... It's just being like cognizant of everything yeah. um, and just understanding that like how often we're playing, like stuff is going to get bent, yeah. whether it's traveling or just use or whatever. So you just got to stay on top of it. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. And kind of the farther along you get to with with competition, like the more the yeah, the little things like that matter, mm -hmm. honestly, for, from a week to week basis, just making sure everything is really consistent. Um, in equipment and making sure, yeah, staying really mm -hmm. disciplined with kind of checking up on that. Um, it's huge as you continue to continue to play it at a higher level. How about the most unique club in the bag, whether it's a rare club or an older club, or maybe you have a, a certain loft that's unique or a, maybe it's bent a certain way that's unique. Um, Jacob, I'll start with you. The, the, maybe the club in the bag that might be the most unique, or maybe you don't have one. Maybe you have a pretty stock standard type of set of clubs. For the most part, it's pretty standard. I play everything pretty stiff. Okay. Um, but in the driver, I just started kind of toying around this summer um, just with different Titleist heads, and I went back okay. to my old TSI head. Oh, really? Okay. And then I went lighter in shaft. So I used to play like a 70-gram X-Flex, and I went to a 60-gram TX, and I cut it to wow. 44 inches. Okay. So it's just short and pretty light it like swing weights at like d0 but now is that something you found it easier to keep it straight i love it yeah because yeah. yeah. i know that's that's very common for at least my I, my understanding is like tour pro is very common to shorten the length of the driver shaft to keep things accurate keep things in the dispersion tight yeah seen that for you too yeah all the woods i play short just for dispersion and just yeah. comfort so yeah it's one of those things I just kind of stumbled on it then you got one for us I'd say my bag is pretty standard as well. Yeah. Um, one thing I did switch up in the spring is I uh, changed the sort of the grind of the bounce on my uh, my 60 degree lob wedge and basically took all the bounce off of the heel um, just to help with kind of some some higher spinnier shots like off some really tight lies or some really firm lies. It's kind of something I already always struggled mm -hmm. with in the past. Um, so I kind of tweaked that to try to help with that and it's it's definitely helped me a lot. Um, it's, it's definitely, it's, it was definitely a little bit different at first, um, but I just like how the club kind of sits on the turf a lot better, especially kind of yeah. when I open up the face and I'm looking to hit a higher, softer shot, like especially off of tighter lies. Yeah, that sounds exactly like something that Larry would, would tell me yeah. um, if I needed to <laughs> improve my short game. Um, and uh, it's funny because so for those who don't know, um, listening, watching, Larry Bobka, who we've had on the program many times, Master Club Fair Minnetonka also serves as a volunteer assistant coach for the Gophers, so you guys are very familiar with him. Um, I guess what what's that like having having Larry out there with you guys? I'm sure he. I, mean, I know if it's anything like when he is here in the office every once in a while, it's lots of stories, lots of life lessons. You know, he's imposing on on people, but is that kind of what it's like for you guys at practice and, and yeah. events too? Yeah, it's pretty weird. I work at the 
second swing Minnetonka location. Okay. So I've worked with yeah, him yeah, for yeah. two years. So it's like nothing new. <laughs> but like when you're on the roads with them, yeah, pretty wild. Yeah, like just, yeah. It's straight stories. Yeah, it's pretty funny. It's but. funny because I know. No, I know. For me, I'm always. I mean, really, the way he tells the story, it's like it's, I'm always on the edge of my seat with it. Yeah, and it's something crazy from, you know, like we we mentioned off air, like Brad Faxon comes up a lot. You know, yep. he and Brad Faxon are really good buddies. You know, or you could talk about his time with Tiger or yeah. you know Phil or whoever else it was. But there's always something that applies from years yeah. and years ago to a certain instance in that moment. It's wild too. Like, I mean, most assistant coaches you'll see like running around like high energy just all yeah. over the place and then you'll just walk up to a part three and just see Larry sitting in a cart and you're like most people just have no idea like what's going on or like yeah. even coaches and then you realize like he's got years and years yeah. more experience than anyone else there yeah it, it it's exactly like I couldn't agree more I mean the like the experience that he has like is so I mean it's invaluable um and all the stuff that he is he's shared with us like from all his years working with some of the, the best guys in the world. Um, like it's, it's been so cool to, to be able to learn from him and yeah, spend a lot of time around him just, just learning. Yeah, that's kind of the, the, what he does here too. I mean, he, he helps the, the staff, myself. It doesn't have to be just the fitters. I mean, I've learned a lot from him just by interacting with him and conversing with him. So um, I've, always, I've just wondered about that because I know he, he coaches you know, he coaches players, he coaches you guys, but he's also like a teacher and a, and a fitter at the same time. And over that many years of just like learning and, and working with the best players in the world, the Payne Stewart's, the Davis Loves, mm -hmm. um, there's a certain level of knowledge that like it's almost like it's too much. It's like spewing out of him all yeah. the time. You know, it's like an overflow. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty wild. But um, he's great. The, uh, how about an example of a weird drill or maybe unique drill that let's say someone like me who's you know I'm, I'm just barely under scratch golf you know I play golf once or twice a week when it's nice out but I'm not like you guys where I'm out there all the time you know trying to compete at the highest level so what's an example of a drill that you guys work on maybe in practice maybe it's a competition between you guys as teammates that you guys do that I would be like what like how does that make you better what is that what is the purpose of that that's all you. <laughs> I um, I mean, one thing that I like to do, I guess that that's probably a little bit a little bit more unique, is I like to work on shot chafing quite a bit okay. in practice. So one thing I'll do is um, work on, um, like Tiger called them as nine windows, um, but oh, basically yep. kind of low, medium, high, and then draw straight fade. Um, so I like to really stay dismal with that, and it just kind of gets me in a frame of mind that's more like like playing golf in practice and hitting different shots and you know trying not to hit the same shot yeah. twice in a row um yeah it just really helps me to yeah just be in a, a a mindset in practice that really keeps me engaged it simulates different situations of the golf course that i may face um because obviously you know as we know there's no two shots in golf that are exactly alike that you can face out mm -hmm. there so just just kind of yeah keeping keeping things uh keeping the variety in practice and just, yeah, just getting really getting ready to, to play. Do you guys do anything like, let's say, cause you guys have like qualifying rounds that mm -hmm. a lot of team, I know like a lot of college teams have qualifying rounds and you know, I don't, I mean, there's certain systems in place to keep a, a I guess a competition between the teammates. So yeah. how does that, how's that dynamic for you guys to kind of compete against yourselves while also understanding like <laughs> it's for, we also have the one purpose of, you know, winning the conference or, or or maybe a goal bigger than that like how does that what's that dynamic like for you guys as teammates I feel like we're pretty lucky we have a team that's very very tight and we all just kind of know we're all trying to get better for like one common goal um you definitely hear of like other teams where I, I don't know if it's like toxic but just yeah. like um I don't know not really wishing the best at your teammates in qualifying right. um but like a lot of guys just kind of understand like um, we're all just going to try and win tournaments mm -hmm. and just best five guys are going to usually end up in that role. Right. So it's pretty supportive all mm -hmm. around, which we're lucky to have. Um, but that's probably the biggest thing with our team, but yeah. it is pretty like weird too. Yeah. Cause it's, it's almost like an iron sharpens iron thing, but yeah. it's like, you know, at, if you have a qualifying round and you guys are probably competing for certain spots in a, in an event, <coughs> you know, almost weekly and 
you have to beat your teammate. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a weird, uh, you have to turn a different switch on mentally to kind of focus on that. It's got to be a little bit awkward because then, Definitely. you know, two days later, if you happen to play well, then you're playing uh, against other schools and you have to have a, that same competitiveness that you just yeah. had towards your own teammate. Yeah. Um, it's got to be very different for you guys. Yeah. Larry calls it the stress open. The stress <laughs> open. Every qualifying, so. All right. <laughs> There's always a different moniker or name for something. Yeah. Doesn't it? Oh, man. Um, so, and can, we can kind of wrap up here a little bit. I know this is, hasn't been super long, but I know we got kind of a tight schedule with some more stuff coming, so stay tuned for that. But a um, lot of junior golfers actually pay attention to our stuff and are watching it and are also paying attention to you guys and probably followed you guys even during your high school days, right? Even maybe there was middle schoolers when you guys were in the high school uh, team. And so for aspiring players that might be trying to get to the level you guys are at playing for the University of Minnesota, um, what would you, maybe some pieces of advice for them to maybe their freshmen, sophomores in high school are trying to make sure they get to that level, um, get recruited at the division one level. Um, any advice for you guys that you guys would give to them? So we'll start with you, Ben. Yeah, I just think self-belief is is so important as you're kind of coming up, especially especially in competitive golf. Um, I mean, yeah, if you don't believe in yourself, you don't believe in, in your process and what you're doing, um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's going to be really hard to, to find success um, at, at, at anything, um, but especially golf, especially golf, because it's such a, uh, you know, nowadays with where the game's kind of headed, right, there's so many good players, um, and it's really a, kind of a, a congested uh, sport almost. Like, there's so many good players, and it's really hard mm -hmm. to succeed and really hard to win. Um, that, those are just the facts. So, like... Uh, if you, I mean, if your self-belief is really high and you just kind of believe that you're going to do it no matter what and you, you, you are willing to do what it takes to get there, um, no matter how hard it may be, um, I mean, you're, that, that's the only way, in my opinion, that you can really kind of get there and achieve your goals, mm -hmm. um, whether it be in junior golf, college golf, pro golf, whatever level it may be. Um, so I think, yeah, self-belief is, is just so, so incredibly important um, in today's game. Mm. Um, for mine, I'd just say you got to have a lot of patience and you also have to be your best friend. Like, um, like Ben said, there's so many good guys out there. Like you just kind of have to know that your chance is going to come. Like you're not going to be there winning every tournament. Like it just doesn't happen. So just kind of being patient with opportunities, um, just tournaments to play in. Um, I was kind of a guy who was more of a late bloomer. I was pretty terrible in high school. Um, That's pretty hard on yourself. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, it was it was sketchy. Like it was not good. Um, yeah, it was just like I never really beat myself up too bad about it. Like I just knew kind of yeah. where I wanted to end up. Um, so just stayed patient with like with the results and just trusted the work. And then I you see so many guys who are just beating themselves up yeah. on the course all day. And it, if you're doing that, it's five hours of just kind of being miserable so you just gotta yeah. that's like have some that's, fun with that's yourself. golf i mean golf is not golf is very frustrating yeah um, and it's actually i it is kind of you know it's it's revealing to to hear that from someone at your level because there's plenty of people that um are watching or listening that might be 12 handicaps and they mm -hmm. might you know go out and fire you know a 90 or something and they might be really upset you see it all the you time know? yeah yeah, yeah. And they <laughs> might be very upset the entire sight. time you know it's yeah. a very common sight they, yeah. they like you said it's four and a half five hours of just being mad at yourself yeah that's literally no, that's no <laughs> especially like with like 12 handicappers and stuff like that matters even more because like they have full-time jobs. You don't have time <laughs> yeah. to practice. Like, exactly. Don't beat yourself like up. They, like, right. this is supposed to be your leisure. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's supposed to be what you do for fun. So, yeah. like, yeah, just making sure to have a good attitude is just, yeah, yeah. it's huge. And getting what you want out of Absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, good attitude always will be a, a key for enjoying golf. It might not be the best round you play that day, but... Um, Coaches love it. Typically, that, you're outside yes. on a beautiful piece of land yeah. on the golf course. Probably a nice day out if you're out there, so... Um, I like that way to, to kind of end this thing and wrap this up. But uh, Ben Warian, Jacob Peterson, thank you guys for, for joining on this. Um, some pretty cool factoids and tidbits from you guys and kind of the insights of playing golf at the University of Minnesota. So, um, and once again, I'll tease it. We got some more stuff coming for you guys on the YouTube channel, so stay tuned. But uh, thank you guys for joining. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Appreciate it.